In the case of the autonomic nervous system, it has a two-neuron system. The first neuron has its cell body in the central nervous system. The second neuron has its cell body in the peripheral nervous system in a ganglion. The first neuron innervates the second neuron. The second neuron innervates the end organ. Because the first neuron has its axon before the ganglion and the second neuron has its axon after the ganglion, we call this a preganglionic and a postganglionic fiber. Preganglionics innervate postganglionics, postganglionics innervate end organs. So for the autonomic system, it's always a two neuron pathway. However, there is going to be one exception to that. One exception. And that one exception will be the adrenal medulla. The reason for that exception is actually pretty clear. Remember, we said that these second neurons of the autonomic system come from neural crest. Well, the adrenal medulla cells come from neural crest. So in essence, the adrenal medulla developmentally are the same as these neurons. It's just that they're not neurons. They never develop an axon. They're just cells that secrete hormones. But they're from neural crest, so they behave as if they were these second neurons, and therefore they are innervated by first neurons. So the adrenal medulla is innervated by a one neuron system or a one neuron pathway because those cells themselves are the same as the second neuron. So that's why the adrenal medulla is different. But with that single exception, all end organs that are autonomically innervated are by a two neuron pathway. Now, <clears throat> that autonomic nervous system can be subdivided into two parts, a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, firstly, keep in mind that because sympathetic and parasympathetic are both parts of or subsets of the autonomic nervous system, that means anything that we said about the autonomic nervous system will be true for both sympathetic and parasympathetics. So, what did we say? We said that the end organs will always be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. That's true for both sympathetics and parasympathetics. We said that there'll always be a two-neuron pathway, with the first neuron cell body being in the CNS, the second neuron cell body being in the PNS. That will be true for both sympathetic and parasympathetic. We said that the first neuron will be derived from neural ectoderm, the second neuron will be derived from neural crest. That will be true for sympathetic and parasympathetic. So, what are the differences then? Well, to understand the differences, we have to sort of go a little deeper into some of those characteristics we just pointed out. The first thing we said was that the cell body of the first neuron will always be in the central nervous system. And that will be true for both sympathetic and parasympathetic. But if we now ask the question, where in the central nervous system will that cell body be located, then we're going to get two different answers. In the case of the sympathetic nervous system, when we say where is the preganglionic pre cell body located, the answer is going to be in the central nervous system, but more specifically in spinal cord levels T1 through L2 only. Spinal cord levels T1 to L2. None of them will be any higher than T1. None of them will be any lower than L2. When we ask that question about parasympathetics, where is the preganglionic cell body located? The first thing we notice is they're not at spinal cord levels T1 to L2. They're not there. Where are they? Well, they're either lower down in the spinal cord at levels S2, 3, and 4, or they are higher up in the central nervous system, so high up that they're not in the spinal cord at all. They're in the brainstem. And they're in the parts of the brainstem associated with cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. Now, the precise locations in the brainstem that they're located in will leave for neuroscience to discuss, but the cranial nerves that they will be associated with will be 3, 7, 9, and 10. So for sympathetics, preganglionic cell bodies are T1 to L2. For parasympathetics, they're either sacral or cranial in location. 
So sometimes the sympathetic system is referred to as the thoracolumbar lumbar system, and the parasympathetic system can be referred to as the craniosacral system. Okay, so that's one difference. A second difference. We said that for both sympathetic and parasympathetic, the postganglionic cell body will be in the peripheral nervous system. Again, we could ask the question, where in the peripheral nervous system? We'll get two different answers. Now, to describe where in the peripheral nervous system, we need to have a frame of reference as a way to describe locations in the peripheral nervous system. And one way we can do that is by using our central nervous system as a reference point and say, so that cell body, that second cell body that's in the peripheral nervous system, how far peripheral is it? In other words, is it close to the central nervous system or is it far away from the central nervous system? And if we do that, then we'll find that for sympathetics, the postganglionic cell bodies tend to be close to the central nervous system. Close to the central nervous system. For parasympathetics, we'll find that the second neurons tend to be far away from the central nervous system. Far away from the central nervous system. Okay? So that's one way of describing the difference. Now, another way to describe the same thing, but using a different reference point, is instead of using the central nervous system as our reference point, let's use the end organ as the reference point, wherever, whatever it is that's being innervated out here, or out here. And so if we use the end organ as a reference point, then we would say those second neurons, rather than saying that they're close to the CNS, we would say they are far from the end organ. Right? That's the same thing, it's just using a different reference point. Instead of saying it's close to the CNS, we're saying it's far from the end organ. And for the parasympathetics, instead of saying it's far from the CNS, we would say it's close to the end organ. Well, that's an important point, to say that parasympathetics, the, sec the cell bodies of the second neurons, the postganglionic neurons, are close to the end organ. Because in most cases, they are so close to the end organ that they are actually found in the wall or on the wall of the organ where that end organ lives. In other words, if the end organ that's being innervated is, let's say, a smooth muscle cell in the airway, or a smooth muscle cell in the stomach, or a smooth muscle cell in the uterus, then that postganglionic neuron has its cell body in the wall of that organ, in the wall of that stomach, in the wall of that uterus, in the wall of that bronchus. Right? That's how close we mean when we say close to the end organ. The word that we give to those kinds of cell bodies that are in the walls or on the walls of organs, we call them terminal ganglia. Terminal ganglia. So we see that word here, terminal ganglia. We see that word here, terminal ganglia. They are referring to postganglionic parasympathetic cell bodies that are in or on the walls of organs. Okay? Always parasympathetic. Okay, now that we have some distinguishing characteristics between sympathetic and parasympathetic, now let's focus on more specific pathways. What is the pathway that sympathetics use to innovate their end organs? And then we'll look at what is the pathway that parasympathetics use to innovate their end organs.